when I agreed to go down to Florida to visit my grandparents, I knew it was probably going to be boring and lame, and I was mostly right. They moved down a few years ago, and I missed them, but I didn't really want to spend a whole week at their house. But when my mother offered to buy me a new phone if I went, I couldn't say no. I figured if it was worth that much to her, it was really important. They picked me up in Miami and Nana hugged me tighter than usual and told me how much they had missed me. I'll be honest, it was pretty touching. The first thing I did when we got to their house was fix their computer, of course. We spent a couple of days wandering around their old person neighborhood, taking lots of walks and going to bed early. I'm pretty sure I was spending an abnormal amount of time on my phone, and it didn't take them long to notice how bored I was. I wasn't trying to be a shit, but my grandparents just have a really low-key retirement. Puppy and I have kayaks now and we can take you to the Everglades if you want. I think that might be fun. Nana offered. I gladly accepted. Not that I'm a kayaker, but I figured anything would be better than hanging around another day. I know that so far I probably sound like I don't like my grandparents, but that is not true at all. I love them very much. I'm just used to watching YouTube and playing video games while they read the newspaper and go for walks. It was a culture shock to me. The next morning, we got up old person early and headed out. Puppy strapped the two kayaks on top of their little car and we were off. We drove south and got to what looked like a boat launch by mid-morning. The place was in the middle of nowhere. But that was the point. There was a little parking area and a box to put a card with your visitor information into, in case you got lost or something. We unpacked and set the kayaks in the water when I realized that we only had two. We won't all fit. I exclaimed as Puppy was putting a lunch bag into one of the kayaks. He kissed me on top of my head and he handed me a hat. Have fun, sweetheart. I'll meet you girls back here this afternoon. He said and gave Nana a quick peck before getting back in the car. I felt bad that he was probably just going to have to hang around in the car waiting for us, but Nana told me not to worry and pulled me into the water. He'll find something to do. We've been here a few times and he's seen it before. Puppy wants you to get to see the park. She insisted and I knew that she was right. But I felt a little bit guilty still. Grandparents just have that effect, don't they? Soon we were off and paddling slowly through the mangroves. It was absolutely beautiful and unlike anywhere else I'd ever been. The trees there are so unique and full of character. I even caught myself thinking that I saw a person out of the corner of my eye a few times. But it always turned out to be just a person-shaped tree. We admired the birds and chatted about school while we paddled. As the day went on, the heat began to build. I was surprised when Nana had handed me a cold bottle of water. The condensation dripped down my arm, giving me a pleasant chill. Of course she had packed all the water into ice. She's my Nana. She thinks of everything. We didn't see another person the whole morning and we stopped for lunch at midday. There was a little patch of sandy earth that didn't have any mangrove roots on it. A rare sight in this area. So we dragged our kayaks on top of it. Nana stretched out her legs but insisted that she was fine to keep paddling. We ate our sandwiches and oranges and we reapplied our bug spray. And then we started to head back. Text Poppy and tell him that we'll be back by 3. Nana told me, checking her watch. I pulled on my phone and I found that we had no signal. Oh, that's right. The phones don't work this far out. Don't worry, we'll get to a spot in an hour that you can text from. My grandmother said. We continued on in no rush. I kept checking my phone for a signal, but as 3pm rolled around, not only had I not found a single bar, but we weren't back at the boat launch like we had planned to be. I'd let it go for another half an hour, figuring that we were probably getting close. 
Nada, it's almost four. Did we take a wrong turn? I asked and she gave me a worried look. She scanned the trees, though I couldn't imagine what she could have been looking for. The whole place was just a wall of hanging branches and air roots. It's overwhelming to try to pick out any variation on the stuff. Another hour went by and we finally stopped to regroup. We were officially lost. Nana grabbed onto the side of my kayak and we sat for a few moments. I watched her, hoping that she was coming up with a plan. Can your phone get us out of here? She asked. I don't have any signal but the GPS should still work. I told her pulling it out. We watched the phone trying to lock on for a couple of minutes. The battery was already at 35% and I cursed myself for leaving it on without signal all day. Eventually a little icon popped up on the app showing us in the Everglades. Since that's where we were, it seemed right enough. I showed my grandmother and she looked at it for a long time. Okay, well, it looks like we should try going back the way we came and see if we can find another passage that'll take us east. She said finally. I was glad that she had come up with something, even if she didn't sound all that confident. We paddled for another hour without finding an eastern traveling waterway. Check it again, Nana asked. After burning another couple percentage points of battery, the thing showed us in the exact same spot it had an hour earlier. Well, that can't be right. We have obviously did not go in a circle, my grandmother said. I think it just doesn't show an exact location, Nana. Maybe we just haven't moved far enough away to register, I suggested. She sat there for a moment and then smiled suddenly. Well, kiddo, we are good and lost, she said with a laugh. She didn't seem scared and that gave me a little bit of confidence. Puppy is going to be annoyed with me. I should have paid better attention. Why don't we keep heading this way and see what we can see? We have to hit the ocean at some point, Nana said. We paddled for another hour, but every time I looked up, it seemed like we were in the same place. All the trees were identical. Every turn held the promise of something different, but when we took it, the same scene always greeted us. The sun started sinking and it was becoming harder to see clearly. Nana paddled towards the side of the waterway and I followed. There was a little island, a bit larger than the one we had stopped to eat lunch on. We pulled our kayaks up onto it and my grandmother stretched her legs and back. I really noticed her age then. She squinted and looked around, and then turned to me and smiled. I'm sorry, Olivia, but I just can't paddle anymore today. She hugged me tightly, and then sat down hard under the root of a tree. What are we going to do? I asked her. We're just going to have to stay out here tonight and see how things look in the morning. It's too dangerous to keep moving in the dark. We'll be fine, sweetheart. This won't be the first time your old grandmother has slept outside. She said with a wink. It'll be mine. I told her and she laughed. Well, you're going to have a good story to tell your mother when you get home. Nana was so mean that she made you sleep outside. She said and I couldn't help but smile. We rested on a tiny beach, but behind us was a wall of mangroves so thick there would be no way to penetrate it without a chainsaw. Nana pulled out a massive flashlight from her bag and then carefully inspected the whole area before taking a seat beside me. Okay, no gators or snakes, so we should be fine. It occurred to me that if I had to be stuck in a situation like this, I was glad it was with her. She'll make sure that we're safe and everything will work out. We talked for several hours, well after sunset and it was actually pretty fun. Eventually, I was yawning though. I laid out onto the sand for a bit but I ended up climbing back into my kayak to sleep. It wasn't the most comfortable place, but it was better than having a snake curl up on me in the dark. 
The nighttime sounds there were amazing. Frogs and bugs and nightbirds were out in all fours. I watched the stars march slowly across the clear sky until I drifted to sleep. Just as I was going under, I was startled back awake by a hoot. Nada, was that a bared owl? I asked her. My grandmother had always been a big bird watcher. She rose up slowly, listening. I couldn't see her well in the dark, so I don't know what kind of expression she was wearing. But she was sitting up straight. Nada? I asked. She reached over and touched my arm gently. I don't know what kind of owl that was. She whispered. I heard a hint of fear and even against the balmy floor tonight. That sent a chill through me. I strained my ears towards it, trying to hear the owl's call again. It took me a few seconds of listening to realize how quiet it had become. No longer were the frogs or the insects singing. There was a sound. A dull soft sound that was only distinguishable because there were no other noises to be heard. It was bird wings gently flapping against the still air. The sound grew and a dark shape passed over us suddenly. I felt the air whip as it moved. And then I sat up. What was that? I whispered, and Nana shushed me. The thing passed over us again. It had to be a bird, but it was very large. I tried to tell myself that it was a heron or something, even though I knew that that couldn't be right. And then I felt it land. It must have set down on a route connected to our island, because everything beneath me shuddered. Nana slowly stood up and stepped out from her kayak. Something else was moving too, and it was getting closer. I saw a dark shape come towards us, stepping slowly from root to root. It was large, the size of a human and shaped kind of like one. My heart jumped to my throat thinking that some person was out there in the mangrove stalking us. Nana flipped on her flashlight and illuminated the shape. The light only lasted a moment before fizzling out. It gave us the glimpse of a thing and I wished that it had been a person. It flinched away from the light, drawing its gnarled, scaly forelimb up across its eyes. It had a perfectly round, flat face like an owl, but it definitely was not an owl. Olivia, go! Get away from here! Nana shouted. With the light out again, we could only see the dark silhouette of the thing. It turned its head towards her voice and it leaped. A great black shadow spread over me as it opened its wings. The creature fell onto me and I felt crushed beneath its weight. Its claws gripped my shoulders and I screamed out. It didn't tear into me though, it only held me tightly. The thing brought its face up to mine, an inch away at most. The starlight shone into its huge saucer eyes. They were shining, round and lidless and they were staring straight into me. I heard my grandmother grunt as she swung her old-fashioned metal flashlight into the thing. The beast cried out and it released me. Its voice was horrific, so near the human but somehow terribly perverted. It spun around and Nada charged at it, swinging and shouting. She managed to get between me and it. Olivia, go, quickly, it'll catch up. Nada demanded, pushing my kayak into the water. I swiveled my body into the little craft and I flipped on my phone flashlight. The thing loomed over my grandmother. It was taller than her by a foot at least, and had a spindly, emaciated body that was spotted unevenly with tufts of dirty feathers. From its back stretched two large wings, covered in patchy, misshapen feathers. It stood on two legs that were straight and long, like human legs. There were forelimbs too where arms should have been, but they were covered in scales and bent in ways no human arms could be. But still, it appeared so similar in shape to a human that it must have once been one that was molded into something more grotesque. 
The creature's horrible limbs were tipped with curved talons that bent towards Nana. I screamed and that round face turned swiftly in my direction. Fear overtook me and I fumbled with my paddle. I caught one glimpse of Nana bashing that thing across the head with her flashlight before I paddled away furiously. The sounds that came to me were terrible, screaming and screeching, and I couldn't bear to stay to hear what was happening to Nana. I didn't wait for her. I paddled through the night, flashing my phone at every noise that I heard. I don't know if the light helped or not, but the thing didn't come for me. I held out hope that Nana would find her way back too to me somehow, but as the sun came up, it became clear that she wouldn't. I don't know how long or far I kayaked, but at some point, I heard voices. Human voices. Eventually, a tour group had found me. I tried to tell them what had happened, but of course, I was young and dehydrated and in shock, so my story wasn't to be believed. They brought me out of the Everglades and back to Puppy. I couldn't tell them what really happened. It was too awful and deep down. I know that I shouldn't have left her like that. All I could tell him was that I got lost. He knew Nana wouldn't leave until she found me, so he organized a search effort for her. It found nothing, of course, and he eventually had to stop looking and admit what I already knew. Nana was gone. My mother flew down to Florida and we both stayed with Puppy for a few weeks. I still can't imagine what he went through losing the woman he had been married to for so long. I was racked with grief and guilt, but his loss is even greater, and I always wondered what had happened to her. Telling him would open up a worse trauma than the thought of her being lost in the Everglades. Near the end of our stay though, he seemed to be improving and some kind of normalcy was returning to his life. I think your Nana is at peace, sweetheart. Puppy said to me one afternoon while we sat on his deck. His voice didn't shake with emotion. It was sure and calm. Tears welled up in my eyes, thinking about what she had did for me. I hope so, I said. I've been hearing an owl at night and I think she sent it to look for us and it told me that she's passed into a peaceful place. She always loved owls, did you know that? She knew every call. He said with a wistful smile on his lips. Yeah, puppy, I knew that. I just wish she was here. I don't recognize the owl's call that I've been hearing, but I'm certain that she would know it. <laughs>